Good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and start the session a bit late, but I'd like to get going. We have, um, I believe, in a, about an hour and a half. Um, a couple of our panelists may not be able to stay the whole time, so we try to get as much inter interaction um, as possible before that happens. My name is James Graber. I'm the Director for Sustainable Development Mechanisms at the UNFCCC, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today on this event about harmonizing the GHG accounting standards to mobilize public and private finance for climate action, about how we're going to improve the standards and uh, the reporting around what's uh, happening in terms of the impact of the, of the investments, basically. Um, the, the objectives of, of this are obviously to foster greater mitigation actions. Um, there's a strong and urgent need, as I think, as we all know, to for the credible and harmonize and recognize uh, re reporting and standards around this um, in order to meet the expectations of the various climate actors. Um, there's a need to accelerate the rhythm of the development of the harmonized standards and expand their coverage um, to include a broader range of other sectors as well, industry, urban, agricultural, forestry, so that they can better serve the Paris Agreement. Um, before we get going, I would like to welcome the panel and would ask each of the panel members to very, very briefly introduce themselves. And uh, obviously, they'll have time to speak a bit more about uh, as they answer the various questions I'm going to put, put, put to them. But if I could ask each of them to briefly introduce themselves, starting with you, Stephanie. Is it on? Is it on? Um, so yeah, Stephanie Svakianos, BNP Paribas. I am responsible for sustainable capital markets at the bank. So we have a small team whose aim is really to foster the bridge between issuers and investors um, to, to develop yeah, strategies for, for greener capital markets. Uh, Good afternoon. My name is Mafalda Duarte. I'm the manager of the Climate Investment Funds. This is a set of, um, it's a multilateral climate finance mechanism that has been, uh, that has capitalized, is capitalized with $8.3 billion and has been in operation since 2008, uh, supporting 72 countries globally with um, climate relevant, low carbon and resilient um, investments. The way I come to this panel as well, I was actually uh, engaged in the um, work of um, GHG accounting and climate finance tracking. So I bring that perspective uh, as well. Hello, Hello everybody. I'm Pierre Forestier. I'm the head of uh, the Climate Change Unit in Agence Française de Développement. Agence Française de Développement is a uh, Open Bank, uh, we finance projects in uh, 80, 80 countries around the world, and we, uh, we finance around uh, 8 billion uh, euro per year. And we have, uh, with uh, this question of climate, uh, a strong strategy and objective with a 50% target, and uh, also uh, a mandatory uh, internal process to assess carbon footprint measurement. That's one key issue for us, and uh, uh, it's also why we are uh, discussing this uh, with the with the group. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jan Willem van der Ven. I'm uh, uh, heading the carbon market development in the EBRD, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Um, I'm associated to the field of greenhouse gas counting. As I've done in the past, uh, quite a number of JI and CDM projects, uh, including uh, methodology developments. Um, and I've helped in the EBRD to set up our uh, accounting system for, uh, uh, for climate funds, as well as the results of climate finance. Good afternoon, everybody. My name's uh, James Close. I'm uh, the director for climate change at the World Bank. Um, and I think while everyone's confessing their past, I would have to let you know that uh, many years ago, I actually trained as a chartered accountant. So uh, I'm very pleased to be back in the world of debits and credits, even if they are carbon ones. Thank you all. Thank you. Um, so this event today, which has um, been organized by the Carbon Investments Fund and the, and the government of Senegal, 
zone harmonization of the standards. What we're trying to um, address here is uh, why the IFI technical working group is, is looking at this, um, what, what's been achieved so far, um, what's going to happen next, um, and, and what do we all need to do to perhaps promulgate um, more robust standards in this area. So with that, if you'll allow me, I'll jump right into asking the panelists here some questions to get us going. Um, we'll have opportunities later also for some questions from, from the floor. So Mafalda, could you tell me um, climate investment funds is a, is a major climate fund, obviously, and you have some experience uh, dealing with this uh, issue. Um, so what have you in encountered so far in terms of your efforts to, to try to put the, 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 the measurements, the GHG accounting in place? Thank you very much. Um, and we are very pleased to be uh, co-organizers of, of this side event and we are uh, trying to uh, see how we can uh, provide further support in addition to uh, what we have been uh, providing in the context of our partnership uh, with the multilateral development banks uh, to really do what James was uh, mentioning, which is how do we accelerate um, the use of these of the methodologies, even the existing ones, um, more broadly across an even a larger group of uh, financial institutions, and how do we move into sectors that uh, we haven't necessarily yet moved into, but are as important as sectors that where we've been doing some work. Most of the work, as has been said, has been on renewable energy and energy efficiency. There's been some attempts in terms of the transport sector, sustainable transport sector. Um, but there are other areas, very important forestry, agriculture, um, that need to be uh, covered um, as well. So uh, it's a pleasure to be co-organizer and to now give uh, our support to this next phase, working in collaboration with UNFCCC and the IFI um, working group. Um, the, this work has been going on for some time, uh, as some of you might know. Uh, for, since at least 2008, um, when the climate investment funds were established at that time, of course, one of the key metrics uh, by which we were going to assess impact was through GHG emission reductions, accounting for GHG emission reductions. So that was, from the beginning, a key metric um, of, the, of two of our programs, which are mitigation programs. And as we um, started to uh, look at that um, metric uh, more closely, we've very quickly realized that the methodologies that either we didn't have methodologies or the methodologies that were being used were not comparable um, across uh, institutions. Uh, and therefore the question then is uh, how do we aggregate? How do we um, give confidence um, to those that put the resources in these mechanisms, to the international process, to the private sector. And I'm going to speak a little bit about the dimension of private capital as well. How do we provide the necessary confidence uh, and, and transparency and in terms of the results and impacts that are being um, achieved? And so the, the multilateral development banks um, and then, you know, with uh, some of the groups of uh, IDFC and uh, Pierre probably will speak a little bit about that as well, uh, put a lot of emphasis uh, in trying to do technical work um, and, and come up with um, more harmonized approaches in the area, as I said, of, of renewable energy and energy. Um, efficiency and this is also critical so this is critical not so, not only from the point of view of GHG accounting but it's critical from the point of view of tracking flows as well they are somehow linked because we will only want to account to finance flows that are actually associated with GHG emission reductions and to understand if in the end we are really net the net positive GHG emission reductions, we need sound methodologies. So there's been quite a bit of work and I'm sure that um, uh, Pierre and 
and William and James will uh, will speak about that. Um, so I don't want to to uh, expand too much. Um, We've been very proud. So what, what the work in the context of the climate investment funds has done is raise issues. We, we keep encountering issues um, that need to be looked at. I, GHG accounting, tracking of climate finance flows. Um, and now we have a, a, another very important area, which is again linked, which uh, the multilateral development banks, other IFIs as well, are issuing more and more green bonds in the markets. Um, these investors uh, also want to know where are these resources going to be directed and how do we know that in reality we are achieving the impact and the results that are um, being promised or hoped for. Um, and so it is very important because we are now talking about the Paris Agreement, the Paris Accord, we are talking about the billions to trillions agenda and the need to tap into capital markets, uh, this work then, you know, um, is critical to move those global fixed income markets uh, and, and allow for the growth of the green bond markets and the confidence in these big private capital pools um, that, um, that what, where they are directing resources is actually producing um, mitigation benefits. So I want to underscore how important it is that UNFCCC devotes attention while well, it is, and that, um, and we are very happy to uh, be working with them and further support the, this technical group in whatever way we can to accelerate um, these efforts. And I'm happy to, um, to take uh, additional questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mafalda. That was very um, insightful. Um, you referred to the, the to the technical working group and James. So I will turn to James now and ask, could you say a few words about the history, the evolution, the achievements the technical working group has had in, in spearheading this effort? Yeah, thank you, uh, James, certainly. Um, I think just to sort of reiterate uh, Mafalda's points and maybe just to add uh, one other point in terms of looking forward, which is that, um, you know, as my uh, 101 accounting course told me, what gets uh, measured gets managed. And I think, you know, that's the basic premise around which we're doing this. I think the context of, uh, of it is uh, extremely important in the light of uh, Article 6 and market mechanisms. And, and just again, to put a little bit of information that we've been talking about uh, over the last uh, week or so is the, the work that we've done on state and trends of carbon markets where the analysis that we've undertaken suggests that uh, if you're able to build carbon markets that uh, that enable you to uh, trade the commitments that you've made in the NDCs, there's up to 30% uh, cost reduction of the mitigation uh, commitments that have been made in the NDCs between now and 2030 and potentially as much as 50% by 2050. So. You know, this really is a prize worth having. Um, and I think, um, you know, we need to think about uh, carbon as a currency. And I think uh, that's, uh, we've got an opportunity to build on the work that we've done to date around um, the IFA working group and um, how that's come together really to start to establish some uh, basic premises around the way in which we do it. And I think, you know, we've been making uh, good progress uh, in terms of uh, taking uh, standardized approaches uh, to things and harmonizing the way that we work as MDBs. Um, I suspect that we've got more to do. Some of these areas are really quite complicated. And uh, the more you dig into them, the more you uh, learn. And um, I think the, the group as it's come together uh, uses the technical expertise of uh, many MDBs and also other IFIs um, and it's been able to use uh, colleagues like uh, the UNFCCC and the uh, GCF and the GEF to sort of participate and expand that, uh, that group. So we've got up to 30 members in the group now and we're always very keen to hear from other members uh, who, so that we can come together and plan this work in a way that 
you know, continues that harmonization and works towards uh, the definition of uh, greenhouse gases as a, as a common currency. I'll leave it at that, James, I think, for the time being. All right, thank you so much. Um, can I turn to you, Pierre? And can you say a few words about why this, this element of GHG accounting is important to, um, to, to AFC? To, to AFC? And yes. To AFC. Um, no, it's important for AFC also. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, <laughs> is that another I'm question? Am I right? <laughs> it is very important. Uh, well, uh, when we engage in this uh, in this area of measuring GHG uh, emission, it was first uh, we use that as a, as a proxy of an impact. Of course, it's. Um, it's the, the main and the most simple type of measurement for a mitigation type of project. So as a proxy, what we had in mind uh, is to push the, the, the discussion on climate issue when we assess projects, is to push um, even to, to oblige uh, operational teams to discuss how they can deal with climate, how they can try to uh, to improve uh, the design, to redesign, even to choose an alternative or this kind of thing. That's the first and very key uh, uh, use of uh, a GHG emission accounting for us, and it was the first. And uh, the second, of course, is uh, to be a bit more accountable, uh, to have, uh, 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 to, to present uh, 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 globally to, not, not, in, not only internally, but also externally, uh, what we are doing and to, to, to provide information. And of course, because we linked this, uh, this uh, GSG emission uh, measurement to what we call is climate or not climate as a project, we can deliver uh, a, a clear message of what we are doing. And then also it helps us decide of some uh, quite ambitious strategy, uh, as I mentioned, for the 50% uh, strategy on, on climate change, 50% uh, uh, for uh, uh, each year commitment, financial commitment. But I think it's also important when uh, this, when we discuss with uh, local counterpart, and in, par in particular when we discuss with uh, local financer, uh, local banks try to push also a small scale renewable uh, energy projects or energy efficiency projects in, 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 counter, in, in enterprise. And they try to also have a sort of uh, better measurement of what they are doing in order to push also for both the operational level, but also uh, for the management to, to, to go in this new area, new fields, new sector, it's very key. Um, it's also uh, very important for, um, uh, as, as Mafalda mentioned, for, uh, I would say, global fi uh, financers such as uh, the CIF, but uh, also the, the Green Climate Fund, because obviously they provide resource with a climate objective, and this resource is uh, implemented by, uh, implemented by institution as we are. And so we, we should have an harmonized approach in order to help the, the Green Climate Fund, the CIF, to have the, 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 the right uh, measurement of what they are doing and to give the right uh, measurement to their shoulder. So that's very important also to go uh, to, to, to this kind of harmonization and for us it was very important also. And uh, as also it, it has been mentioned, it's very important for uh, the market. Uh, we uh, issue uh, a 1 billion euro uh, climate bond uh, two years ago and we, we, uh, we, uh, we, uh, this, the, the report we made or the, the engagement we, we provide to the, to, the, to the buyer of the bond was to have only projects uh, invested by the, by the, by the, 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 the bond in, uh, with, with GHG emission um, a decrease in GHG emissions, so they can we can provide a, a robust uh, uh, report and a robust uh, measurement of what they are invest in, and it's very important to to involve the market in this kind of uh, of uh, uh, bond. 
Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. Um, Stephanie, question for you. In the absence of standards um, in the green bond market, um, standing in the way of scale? I, I, yes, clearly. Um, I think standards on their own are not, they're, they're a necessary but not a sufficient condition. I think we could go on all day on what all the sufficient conditions are to scale up the green bond market, but I don't have any doubt that standards is one of the things that is getting in the way. You know, at the moment, I think there are a lot of people getting very excited about the green bond market. You know, it's specifically stated as being a policy instrument for a number of those countries who've chosen to set out um, a green finance plan. It's obviously highlighted by, by the G20. It's, it, you know, it's obviously a, a, a product that we're all very excited about, but the reality is it's very small. Um, and, you know, we are, uh, part of the Green Bond Principles Executive Committee, as your colleagues are as well. And this is the topic that comes up most. Where are the green standards? Where are the standards? Because at the moment you have this patchwork of providers whose credibility is potentially in doubt, whose methodology may not be very transparent, may not be very robust. And of course, the challenge is that investors aren't discriminating. You know, you've got, for example, corporate risk, IFC risk, um, if anything went wrong with your projects, um, you know, the investor wouldn't get his money back. Um, perhaps not a problem for you, but to get scale, we need to bring in new players. Um, and those new players are where really the challenges are going to arise, because for them, we are going to need something that's a lot more robust than what we have now. So, you know, this is a very long way around of saying yes. Um, I think we need, uh, we need, we need independence, we need credibility, and we need some kind of metrics that everyone can sign up to. I'm completely convinced of that. All right, thank you for that perspective. Um, Jan Willem, can you say a bit about um, any barriers that you faced in your organization to signing up to this effort to try to harmonize? None. Yeah. <laughs> Been that easy, huh? Yeah, very easy. I think uh, we, we benefited a lot from, uh, otherwise we would not be that far as, uh, as I said in the, in the introduction, uh, we're working on uh, CDM and JI projects and um, let's say we were able to monetize uh, the carbon emissions in the market. Uh, then of course the market came down and um, but there was still a whole body of uh, experience uh, and working through the methodology we even uh, contributed to some of the methodology developments, for example, on the in the field of energy efficiency rehabilitation of power plants. Um, I think that helped to pave the way um, to to further work on this uh, this issue, and in particular when the CTF and uh, and SIFs and uh, other climate funds were emerging and to fill the gap that uh, at the void that was uh, left there by the carbon market. Um, the yeah the, the donors of course will ask for uh, to know that uh, a ton is a ton and uh, emission reductions etc so um and then we came to the to some cases to projects where uh, where one organization was making this calculation and the other organization was making another calculation and then we saw that uh, numbers were different as to uh, on the same project uh, we were uh, advising uh, the car, uh, some of the climate funds, and and that of course led to a debate and uh, a need to further harmonise. And again, there is where I think the CDM methodologies of uh, a body of experience, which is quite uh, quite useful. Now things are changing, of course. We now have the Paris Agreement, and we have uh, Article Two saying that we need to align financial instruments with the two degrees world and we have uh, uh, let's say article six to be worked on we have the transparency framework so the number of potential usages uh, is uh, still increasing uh, there the are different points of demand for this type of work um, but let's say us as organizations uh, we invest in projects so we're still very keen to make what we report on our own projects that it is correct and that it is comparable and credible and, uh, and and that it all adds up so to say yeah that's our key function of our work and therefore we try to harmonize in the 
in the working group with uh, with other parties. But uh, yeah, uh, the Paris Agreement also said that we should uh, continue the, the body uh, with the good body of experience. And I guess that's the reason why we sit on the table here with you, uh, Jeff. Thank you, thank you. Um, James, can I come yeah. back to you on something? Um, yeah. Um, you you talk, touched upon it a bit already, but can you say a bit more about the value of the harmonization effort, and particularly um, it's, as it's come up, the link between the, the, the difference between the MDBs and IFIs and yeah. how we, what's the true value we're seeing here? Yes, I, I, absolutely, James. And I think uh, it's uh, it's pretty obvious that there's it's important that um, MDBs and IFIs need to calculate and report numbers based on similar methodologies uh, so that we've got a greater degree of consistency across organizations. Um, and we don't want to confuse, you know, donors, clients, co-investors, uh, whoever it might be. So it's very important that we get this uh, consistency of approaches and that we can build confidence that um, the numbers that we are putting forward are actually uh, consistent with those of other uh, organizations. Now, I think we've done a lot on the methodologies to date. I think we've got a bit more to do on the reporting. I think that still um, needs uh, needs some work. So we're very committed to doing that uh, and doing it in a way that I think sets an example to others as well. I think uh, uh, we we expect uh, the NDCs to be implemented in a way that uh, is robust and reflects the commitments that are made. And you know we would expect the those commitments to be underpinned by you know good quality uh, measurement and accounting. So if we can't put our house in order, it's very difficult for us to expect uh, others to do the same thing. Um, and we you know we really think this is advantageous to all. I think it enables us to take some of the risk out of our portfolios, uh, particularly as we uh, look to a world in which uh, in which some of the things that perhaps we've done in the past won't, we won't be able to do in the future in, in, in terms of the types of investments uh, that we might undertake. Um, and it also enables us to highlight the areas of uh, positive contribution that we've got in our portfolio. Uh, so, um, so I'd say that this is a really important uh, piece of work that enhances our uh, credibility and independence uh, as we as we uh, move it forward in a way that uh, uh, that is consistent and harmonised. Thank you. Um, at, at the end there, you talked about the mention uh, the positive contribution, and I think um, Pierre earlier was talking also about about messaging. Um, so I would ask my father, can you say a few words about what 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 CIF um, role in promoting, I mean, in speaking to this issue and giving it the attention that it needs? Yeah, Pierre was uh, alluding to it. I mean, the advantage the advantage of having these discussions in context of uh, climate finance mechanisms like the climate investment fund is that we have a very focused mandate. Um, our mandate is to support um, mitigation and adaptation investments. Um, and so, you know, um, our, what Pierre described as our shareholders expect from us um, that in contexts where it might be more difficult to advance the agenda more quickly, that we give an impulse to those um, agendas. And as I was saying before, um, we sort of, in the context of the, because we have this very focused mandate, because they are very serious expectations about how we are accountable uh, in terms of how the resources that we have are being deployed and used. Um, basically, it, you know, we pay a lot of attention to, to these issues and very quickly, as I said, as soon as we started doing work, we realized that there were a uh, divergence of methodologies across uh, institutions that there were no methodologies. We are currently faced with, with one situation in the forestry sector, uh, which is not just divergence across IFIs, but divergence across IFIs and the country level MRV systems. And so, you know, we need to, uh, and, and these issues become very, vis very visible to us. Um, and because of our very focused um, mandate as well, um, 
we can support, try to support and drive with the, uh, with the resources, with technical expertise, um, the work of the, 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 the working group, um, but also at the country level. We do work quite closely and try to support um, you know, our, our, with our, our own uh, team, but with, in partnership with um, the multilateral development banks who are the implementing entities of the climate investment funds and others, work with the countries in enhancing their own systems as well. The countries will also need, um, you know, will also need support uh, in enhancing their own uh, M&E systems, which will include also GHG um, accounting. So um, we are well positioned um, and we are committed um, to, as I said earlier as well, to, to work with you, to work with you, the NFCCC with the working group, with others, and through other initiatives that we have as well, when we work directly with the countries or with other institutions, help these efforts also trickle down um, to those as well. I, I, Kira, let me turn back to you now again um, and give you an opportunity also to speak to more, more specifically, if you like, on exactly um, at, at AFB, um, how are you doing that as well? Thanks, thanks, James. Um, well, um, th there is not uh, real specificity uh, comparing MDBs or uh, international financial institution uh, to uh, to, uh, to, uh, to to employ um, to use uh, GSC emission accounting, and and of course we have the same uh, view regarding the need of harmonization. Of course, because there is a demand from our shareholders, the same. Uh, there is a demand from the counterparts. They need to know better what we are doing and the impact we can have. Uh, there is a, an international uh, more and more pressure to have uh, uh, accountability by all the financiers, and of course, specifically by international financiers. And we have the same issue regarding how to implement internally, the same issue regarding how to use, how to deal with the operational teams, how to, to calculate this kind of thing, how to use this calculation. Uh, so there, I think we have the same, well, uh, the same view uh, and the same need and the same, uh, the, 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 the same, yes, the same need for harmonization on, on this. Of course, on our side, we, we, uh, we try to implement GHA accounting and uh, GHA measurement for uh, 10 years now, so we, we can uh, uh, exchange with, uh, with other to, uh, on this, those different issues in order to, 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 uh, to, to exchange on best practices and this kind of thing. Uh, but also what I think is key is not only international financer, it's also national financer. Uh, what we, we should have in mind is how to uh, have a better impact when harmonizing uh, this approach, the, a better impact on all the financial sector, private and public, national uh, in particular. We, uh, with uh, the International Development Finance Club, which is a, a club uh, gathering uh, 23 uh, institutions around the world, which are uh, a lot of them are national, uh, we try to, to push this agenda, we try to help some of them, for instance, the, the South African Development Bank, the, uh, the, the CAF, to, to implement this kind of measurements, to uh, organize this internally, uh, because it's also for them very key for their governments, for uh, their shareholders to, to, uh, to, to, uh, to present what they are doing and to valorize what they are doing in, in the field. So, uh, the next step is probably to that the international institution also take care of and mobilize all the other uh, financiers to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to 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 be to join the, this harmonization process. Thank you, Pierre. Stephanie, I want to turn back to the the earlier question about um, scale and standards. And you clearly said, yes, it's part of the problem. Uh, standards would help us move the scale. Um, but how do you see this in terms of um, to, to really get the volumes that we need? Um, do you think this is something that should be left purely to the private sector? 
it's it's very tough for me to see how that can happen. Um, you know, one of the challenges with the private sector providers is there's not a huge amount of transparency about their methodologies. Um, they're being paid by issuers to provide opinions on things, and you know, if we remember what happened with the rating agencies, you know, what could possibly go wrong? So I think there are all sorts of questions about 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 some of the providers. But I think you know, one of the challenges is that investors have to be a little bit more discriminating. You know, I think if they're buying a bond now on the basis of the underlying credit risk, um, they're not going to pay more if they've had a second opinion from someone who they know to be robust um, compared to the second opinion, which they know is not particularly robust because their fallback position is that they've got that corporate risk. So I think that's one of the questions that needs to be addressed. But you know, looking at the providers in the market right now and looking at the scale of climate finance um, that has to be absorbed by the private sector, it's very hard for me to see any players that have got the credibility, um, the international credibility and the acceptability um, to all players um, that, that, that are around right now. You know, I do hear people suggesting that perhaps the credit rating agencies should step up and um, uh, provide a more comprehensive service. In other words, when they tell you that, you know, that something is AAA, that actually they've looked at all the risks, including climate risk, and which I think would, would be questioned. Um, but it seems to me that there are a number of, if you like, public sector multilateral players who are doing, you know, we, we obviously we talk a lot to, to Ms. Amber's team who are doing this work. And it's hard for me to see why that wouldn't be a better solution than anything that's available right now. All right, thank you for that perspective. Um, maybe we'll have an opportunity for others to comment on that as well later. Um, Jan Dillon, we've heard is now another another uh, concern or challenge. We've heard several challenges so far. Um, you want to give us a bit of your view on what are the the, the, the challenges? Harmonizing are gonna, that we're going to that we're going to face. What does this entail? What are the real big things we're going to have to? Um, I, I think think let's say it's here. the same. Uh, well, in my view, one of the things we have to guard against um, is that uh, uh, let's say we would like to see precision and robustness, uh, but that all may come at transaction cost. And what we need to be guarding again, and we have seen an uh, ever-growing increase of, on demands, on transactions, of the disclosure, not only in green gas emissions, but a whole range of other uh, elements we need to report on. Now, that's kind of fine for the MDBs, uh, because we can leverage and other resources to fill uh, the work that needs to be done. But the moment that you may try to make the connection with the private sector, then it becomes often a very difficult story. So I think, um, and that we see, for example, in our credit lines for sustainable energy, that uh, we also there then need technical resources to add to these private sector banks in order to make sure that we don't make the, uh, uh, let's say, reporting requirements too erroneous. So I think there's a, there's a battlefield ahead between uh, making sure it's simple, uh, simple and reportable, and uh, and that we use, uh, let's say, statistical sampling uh, rather than having to review every single project. Uh, but on the other hand, of course, we need to make sure that the numbers still stack up, and um, and that's uh, that's a whole uh, yeah uh, that needs to be developed. I think. In countries where there's carbon pricing, whether it's carbon market or carbon tax, I think that you could demand a higher level of, uh, or, uh, let's say, or, of reliability and uh, precision in countries where those things still not exist. I think we need to be careful because in the end of the day, we want to do projects. We want to invest in uh, zero carbon or low carbon or carbon neutral and climate resilient. Um, and uh, all, all attention that goes to administrative processes is a, uh, is a, is a barrier in itself. Yeah. So we need to be, again, let's be, uh, 
let's be careful here not to uh, overshoot the target and, uh, and make sure that we can still deliver the climate finance on the ground. Thank you. That reminds me, of, uh, as you well know, working in the carbon markets and the difficulties we've had grappling with the difference between something being complex but not having to be made complicated. So <laughs> I think we're going to be addressing the same issues here. Um, let me ask James another question. Um, I understand you'll have to be going very soon. So yes, let me get one, one, one more in. I hope we're with you. Um, what benefits um, from the point of view of the technical working group do you see of collaborating with UNFCC yeah. um, in, in this effort? Um, and specifically, um, how, how would you see this collaboration affect the working group? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, just a shameless plug before I go, I'm actually going to launch Innovate for Climate, which uh, for those of you who've uh, enjoyed the uh, very rich conversations between the public sector, the private sector and policymakers at Carbon Expo, this is going to be the new generation of uh, opportunity for actors to come together and have a conversation around climate finance. So. I'm sure we'll be taking this conversation into that area, uh, James, as well. Um, but specifically, I think uh, on the, the our collaboration here, uh, we had a, um, a meeting in London, which I think you uh, hosted, Jan Willem of the EBRD. Um, and uh, at that meeting, uh, I think uh, UNFCCC uh, proposed to host the next meeting. And I think at that meeting, uh, Christiana Bregueris, uh exhorted us all as the IFIs to accelerate our, our efforts on GHD accounting and she put uh, at our disposal uh, the uh, offices of uh, the UNFCCC. Um, I think anybody who can land a climate deal uh, in Paris can manage to persuade a number of uh, IFIs to come together and um, uh, start to uh, build that collaboration. So we've been very pleased to uh, be partnering uh, with the UNFCCC. I think it's in all our interests around this. I think uh, it's important that uh, that we uh, come out of these uh, negotiations with a gold standard for uh, for carbon and uh, the carbon currency I talked about earlier. And I think uh, UNFCCC has a very important role to play in that. Uh, but what I'd really like to see coming out of that collaboration is. Um, a work program with clear, well-defined joint milestones that enables us to uh, really roll up our sleeves and to commit to this endeavor uh, and to demonstrate that we can, uh, uh, a, a, as a group, show leadership around this because of you know, some of the reasons that Stephanie has talked about in terms of attracting the kind of private sector finance that we're going to need uh, to enable us to uh, get the money flowing to deal with the, with the climate uh, challenge. Um, so, um, so yes, I'm, I really look forward to that continued collaboration and uh, continuing to raise our game collectively around all of this. Thank you for that, that word of confidence. We look forward also to working in this area. Um, Stephanie, just, uh, just uh, James just alluded to the, the, the investors again. Let me ask you, um, what, what's, what would you say are the actual value addition to the IFIs working uh, with the likes of the secretary the technical back technical expertise um from the viewpoint of the investors well i think just 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 to take a step back i think you know one of the challenges that, that, that i can identify in the market is that um i think there is a place for a green bond with highly highly robust um technical standards behind it i also think there's a role for a green issuer. And I think at the moment what we've got is we've got a little bit of a halfway house. So instead of having um, a green bond which has got those robust standards attached to it for which an investor may potentially at some point be willing to pay more. So for example, if you take BlackRock as an investor, BlackRock can have a fund which they can market to investors on the basis, if you invest in this fund, you save X thousand tons of greenhouse gas emissions. And the reason we can tell you this is because we're measuring it, our issuers are measuring it, and they're measuring it in a way that we can demonstrate is robust. Now, I can see there's a huge role for that, and that's where I think these standards are needed. I don't think that everybody in the market, if you're a wind farm promoter, 
you need necessarily to go through this particular process because I think there is a place for people to be green issuers. And you know, I was talking to the woman from Legal and General earlier today, the head of sustainability. She says exactly that. She said, we will do our homework. We will actually look at the standards that the ESG standards for, for an issuer and we can decide whether or not we think they're less risky because their scores are very high. So I don't think that everybody needs to jump through all these hoops. I don't think we're saying that every company in the world needs to sign up to this you know, huge gold standard. But on the other hand, for those particular investors where this is what they're marketing, um, it doesn't make any sense to be trying to do that if you're just accepting a second opinion from anyone because you say well we don't think they're that great but you know it's better than not having one at all you know i just think that that's a nonsensical argument so you know i think there is a need um but i also think we have to bear in mind that um there's a vast spectrum of investor appetite out there um and we can accommodate both without i think um incurring too much cost thank you well we need to start looking forward so I'll turn to Jan Willem to tell me what, what is the what do you expect to come next? Um, why all difficult questions come to me? Huh? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe I'm a difficult person, so I can handle difficult uh, questions. Um, now, uh, let's say one of the things that um, I foresee, which will we will have a few debates around, is. Um, the other notion, I already mentioned Article 2, but there is also the notion that we need to be carbon neutral by 2050. And a lot of the methodologies refer to baselines, uh, whether kind of business as usual. Um, so um, let's say in my thinking, at least, I already made the switch that we need to throw out uh, the concept of additionality uh, in the old uh, in the old way, so where we uh, spend a lot of times to prove that we want to do invest in a project that in fact in fact is uninvestable, but we still invest in it. Yeah, that was the <laughs> the additionality under the CDM, uh, and of course that leads to uh, a whole array of nice work for consultants and so on, but doesn't bring us further as to investing in good projects. So I think uh, we need to um, look at that uh, 2050 target seriously and and see how that corresponds to baseline assessments and, and what it means. Uh, probably needs that means that we all are going to take a haircut on the emission reductions we report. But I think that's the reality. Uh, because otherwise we will not realize uh, the carbon neutrality by 2050. Um, so to me, and again, I'm not on the on the, the little nitty gritty of the how to do it as to methodology, but uh, I think that's where the future lies and, uh, and we need to work on. Thank you, Pierre. In the longer term, how should the group develop approaches to, pro to project the GHG accounting? Thank you. Well, um, I, I, th I think in three areas. But first, I, I will I will say that uh, um, it, it's important to recall that the group uh, has been rightly focused so far. Uh, on essential parameters to ensure harmonized approach. It means perimeter of the analysis. It means uh, uh, principles to adopt the baseline. It means uh, 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 factors, database, this kind of thing. It's, it seems very technical, but it's very key because there you have credibility uh, when you go for harmonization. So, we managed to work on that. It's very difficult. I mean, expertise means uh, uh, a lot of compromise in a way. And at the end, we managed to provide uh, quite a robust harmonized approach for at least three areas, transport, renewable energy, energy efficiency. And it's, it's of course, then the next step is to, to keep on working on that, to extend the scope, to extend on other sector. That's obviously 
the, the, the first area. We have still to work, but we, we managed to, to reach some, some good, some good, uh, some good point. Uh, there is another, another eye for me. It's obviously also to disseminate. We uh, discuss about how to approach uh, among international financiers, but also how to approach uh, through, with this uh, methodology and modernized methodology, uh, national development banks, uh, uh, private sector, private financer. It's, it's very key to have then this new approach to disseminate and try and help other to integrate and join. And I would say the third area is to go beyond the GHA measurements. It's very one very interesting and important uh, measure and, and parameter. It will, it will be key and still be key in the future. But what we need new, now is also to have also a new type of indicators, in particular, the contribution to the NDC's approach, the contribution to the uh, the, what, what, the, what the country provides as commitment or contribution, as, as, as UNFCC mentioned. But it means we need to know not only whether it is good and decrease emission, but we have to go a bit on a qualitative approach, seeing how it contributes to the, to the, to the inflection of the curve or to the, 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 the commitment uh, taken by, by countries. It's the same at the local authority level, the same for uh, private sector. So that's the free area. Keeping working on technical aspects, go a bit uh, beyond other, sec on other sectors, disseminate, and then try to work on other type of uh, metrics and, uh, and uh, in particular to, to, to help a, be a, a bit more uh, re re redirect flows and redirect strategies of financing. <laughs> Sounds like quite a bit, <laughs> but yeah, very good. Um, well, I do want to offer some opportunities. Um, we have a, we have some time remaining to the floor for questions. Um, could I ask that you um, introduce yourself and uh, if, if the question is to specific panelists to 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 indicate so. Yes, please. Mike's coming, just a second. Thank you. I'm uh, Hans Ola Wiebrek from the Norwegian Ministry of Finance. Um, just I would like to uh, welcome the work uh, being done by the MDBs. I think this is uh, crucial. As a donor, of course, it's not too easy for us to find the relevant figures when we are being asked uh, in terms of what are we contributing to in terms of greenhouse gas uh, reduction efforts. Uh, we were just recently asked by the Minister of Finance to clearly document what all of you are doing and frankly speaking that was not easy. So, that's, uh, so there is still a lot of work to be done in terms of disseminating and using the results. Having said this, um, I would like to advertise a little bit of the work that we've been doing. We've established a Gigaton coalition together with uh, UNEP. UNEP C is an active uh, party uh, to the coalition, which is not formalized, but uh, we have, uh, we have uh, published two reports. The second report was published now together with UNEP's GAP report in London, 3rd of November. In this report, we have actually looked at 224 renewable and energy efficiency projects. And we estimated the annual savings uh, through this uh, sample, and that uh, amounts to about a uh, little bit less than or 120 million tons per year potential uh, reductions in 2020. If we scale up this to the total amount of support provided to renewable energy and energy efficiency, it will amount to about 400 million tons. Uh, and then subsequently, if you try to scale that up further, we estimate that we could achieve reductions in 2020 by one gigaton. The challenges that we are faced with and we saw is that, of course, none of you are, or not, you are harmonizing with a lot of other actors out there that are not harmonized within the same framework as uh, you are developing. So there's a need to start focusing on this and very, and few energy initiatives are actually doing a good enough job in terms of measuring this. 
we were looking at uh, some of the challenges in terms of moving forward and of course energy efficiency is uh, uh, the key area where uh, we need to do a lot more work uh, renewable energy is probably a little bit easier but uh, energy efficiency is more difficult we have the issue of accounting scope which also has been uh, been mentioned uh, you are all uh, not necessarily you sitting on the table but many actors are using different periods when they're reporting um, estimated uh, greenhouse gas reductions and then we have of course a key issue for us donors and that is indirect effects uh, how to uh, calculate uh, savings from uh, technical capacity building efforts policy support etc and then it was all alluded to of course the baseline issue we would like to continue this work together with UNEP and then bring in uh, uh, the key actors to, to see whether we can move towards more uh, harmonization among several actors and sort of help you to to expand the scope uh, I think that from a personal mark, I think it will be difficult for us to get the World Bank to harmonize around a new set of metrics, but uh, at least we can see whether we can bring in other actors into the work that you're doing. So, personal advertisement for the Gigaton Coalition Report, so just look into the website. Thank you, but maybe one of the panelists would, would like to address the issue of you. You're, you're saying, great, we're harmonizing, but there's more a larger community that we need to harmonize with. Does anyone want to respond to what we, we could do to try to address that? Okay, what I'm saying now it will be controversial, but uh, just to add. <laughs> no, I think um, eventually um, all numbers need to stagger, uh, be, be able to stack up. And um, so we do projects and finance projects, but eventually for projects, uh, the whole aggregate of it will be reflected in, uh, in NDCs. So I think uh, as to what the normative, eventually normative system needs to come out of the Paris Agreement and uh, mandates need to be provided by, by parties on uh, how, how you're going to count. Probably Article 6 will be leading on that because that is uh, where some accounting provisions are, have been put. And I understand that by 2023, the general the general accounting rules for the NDCs need to come out but again uh, uh, on accounting you start with the little ones and then you add up to the big ones yeah that's probably the the process and I think in the meantime whilst that mandate is not completely clear I think we're still being subject to requests by donors to report and uh, and here's where we need to uh, let's say at, at, le at the minimum, uh, uh, disclose how we see these methodologies so that if parties want to kind of join up or join in, that uh, they can start using the uh, same. But it would, be, in my view, be better if there's a clear mandate uh, for this work to be done. Further questions in the back there? Please introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll go a step further and I'll stand up. My name is Tozi Zokufa. I'm coming from uh, Cape Town, South Africa. I uh, represent a couple of organizations as a consultant. One of them is a greener world and the other one is brighter green. But I uh, don't have really a vested interest in this topic, but just for clarity, I wanted to find out if is there a international protocol that exists for GHG inventories, both for urban areas and rural areas. And um, the second one would be a lot of programs have been mentioned that they do exist. Just wanted to find out how comparable are they, these, these, these programs. And then maybe lastly, the government of Senegal is sponsoring this, this event. Do they have a vested interest in, in this topic? I'm asking because coming from a BRICS sort of uh, coalition, how are developing countries and countries in transition, how do they fare when it comes to this particular topic and where are they? Thank you very much. Okay, a number of questions there. Maybe, maybe I just can try one thing, um, one answer, but the, um, the first for me is uh, 
understand well what we are doing there among financer is uh, applying uh, a methodology for uh, measuring uh, impact we have when we finance projects. It's not uh, the the same at all regarding what countries have as a mandatory uh, obligation uh, uh, to have an inventory of their emission. It's very separate. It's completely different. We 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 use that to have an, a proxy, an approach of what type of impact we can provide when we finance with a long-term period an investment. So what this investment compared to a baseline can do and will provide as GSG emission. That's the, the issue. And it's different the way it's <coughs> the methodology and uh, of course the, the mandate is very different than when uh, a country is delivering its inventory of emission. So it's separate. But it doesn't mean that for her it's, it's something very key. It's, it's the, the action, the ad, action agenda in a way. It's, it's the, 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 the commitment the financers are doing. So of course we are international financers. So we have a sort of a, a push from our shareholder to, to go to be ahead. That's why I say, but we have to uh, mobilize the other because it, it's very important for every type of institution and for the market to have a better view of what type of impact they have when they finance this and this. That's the, the first step for a strategy. Then the second step is to decide when. When I know, I can decide whether I will make this priority or, or another one, what type of objective I can have. So that's, that, that's the first step for a financial action. But just for to be very clear, you, we have, you have to differentiate what is the mandatory approach for a country uh, with the international accountability that is decided by the, by the EPA and the financial approach, which is something different. It's also accountability, but not only accountability, it's also operational. Oh, just, just uh, I guess an observation from me, and I have to say this is kind of beyond my pay grade, this question really, but I'm gonna answer it anyway. Um, I think the question is, there isn't enough of a link, but what I ask myself is why not? Because actually, if you look at things like the SDGs and you look at the extent to which everybody has get involved in those and, and it's recognized that business is a huge contributor to the SDGs of which one is clearly climate. It's not obvious to me why we're not all singing from the same hymn sheet. And this is, I think, where I come back to my original point, which is that we, th th there's, no, there's no rational reason for private providers to be the, the arbiters of, of, of these standards. You need a standard that everyone can sign up to. And you know, the Paris Climate Agreement is the only thing that everyone signed up to that I know about. Um, and that seems to me just to be a logical starting point for collaborating. Um, I mean, just, just, just on, 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 the, on the Green Bond principles, which is just a you know, tiny little sideshow, really. Um, you know, one of the work streams we're working on now is green standards. And it's just like a zoo. I mean, there are just, thousands of people popping up out of the woodwork saying, I've got one, I've got one, no, I've got one, no, use mine. I mean, that's just not, that's just not the way forward. And, um, you know, we need, we need something, I think, that, that everyone can sign up to. I'm so used to push a button here, but there is no button. Um, I, I want to come back to the uh, involvement of parties. Um, let's say, the, the, the accounting rules are for a large part now advised by the, the whole body of CDM methodologies. And if you look at the history, how these CDM methodologies came to play, it were project sponsors from all over the world, government and public, non-public, private, that were sending their methodologies to the CDM executive board. There was a uh, okay, we can discuss, but uh, there was a degree of a rigorous discussion as to these uh, methodologies. Over time, there has been a, a consolidation of methodologies. So there's a whole way of thinking. And I think, um, yeah, going for, forward, we, we need uh, something similar, but there is no clear mandate for that. So in the meantime, we need to still keep on reporting on the good stuff we're doing. And, uh, and 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 fill the void for a little while, but 
eventually there needs to be a similar openness or, and, and review and, and, and that, that it really gets an international standing and a core from as many parties as possible. Thank you. Um, any further questions for the panel here? In the back there. Thank you. Uh, Charles Allison from ERM, uh, an environmental consulting firm. So, so you, one of you on the panel mentioned the concept of, of looking at other metrics. Uh, so not just talking about greenhouse gas emissions in terms of tons. Um, you know, to, to what extent do you think there is an opportunity to be looking at um, at other surrogate metrics? I, I'd, I'd maybe use the use an example from the transport sector. So you know, investing in, let's say, light rapid transit schemes. Um, an absolute nightmare to work out what really is going to be delivered by those schemes in 10 or 15 or 20 years in terms of greenhouse gas emission uh, reductions. Um, you know, is, is there a shortcut to actually trying to um, you know, do that accounting that, that, that lets you get, you know, get money invested more quickly and get, um, get benefits more quickly? I can try first. Uh, um, when, when we speak about new metrics, probably uh, there are different aspects. Um, the, the first one is that obviously when we uh, measure carbon footprint emission project, we use this as much more as a, a yes or no uh, um, uh, measurement. It means for me, at the end, you know when then you have a measurement and you know whether it is good for climate or not good for climate. You know, uh, it's I simplify a bit. You, you can also help rational team to redesign a bit the, the, the project, but the reality is a bit quantitative. But now and after the Paris Agreement, because you have the NDC, because you have not uh, uh, an only a, a McKinsey type of curve anyway. Uh, you, you have a, a, a commitment of a country and the commitment of countries compromise between a lot of uh, aspects, not only climate, it's a new area, you have technology, uh, uh, you have uh, social capacity, you have economical capacity, environmental impact, such, well, you have a sort of uh, new um, model of development with new, uh, with compromise of what can be done. And then you can't use any more only very restrictive type of, uh, of uh, uh, metrics that, such as this. And you, ha you have to Im imagine other type of metrics that allow a debate with the country, that allow a debate with the local authority or the private sector saying, well, what can be your contribution and what can be uh, the, 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 the better contribution? <laughs> anyway, that, that's the, 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 the type of lexical we should uh, try to discuss, implement uh, with everybody. So, of course, there will still be at the hand a measurement of uh, a GHI uh, impact, but there must be other type of metrics say, well, anyway, even it is not the best impact you can have, even if it is not the, 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 the best type of project of the McKinsey curve, then what can be the best, the, your, what, what is the contribution and what, what it means for the long-term effect you have. Is there a lock-in effect or not? Is there flexibility for the long-term? Is there, well, all this kind of thing. So that's why I say you, you, you must work on all the metrics. That's an area we are working on for our new strategy at AFD. It's not easy because of obviously uh, the, the, the very simple GHJ emission accounting I mean, simple, <laughs> it's not very simple, but anyway, it's, it's, it's more simple than other. It's, it's, uh, it, it's something very, well, uh, we are very at ease with that. So, yes, but we have to work on more com complex type of, uh, of metrics and, and, and approach also. Let's say for the working group, I think the focus is on greenhouse gas accounting. Uh, other co-benefits, there's work being done. 
Um, again, I am participating in a number of Article 6 uh, discussions. There's Article 6.8 where we can put in uh, the non-market mechanisms, where we can put in a host of uh, co-benefit metrics. Um, but the greenhouse gas accounting, if I look at the workshop and the speed at which we are going, we better concentrate and focus on that. Uh, because we have done in the past two years three methodologies, so to say, and there's a host of, uh, uh, there's a lot more to be done. Now, I think you're raising another question, and it's on some projects, yeah, the emission reduction numbers are not that big, so uh, that's the reality. But I think we need to all to be clear that, uh, yeah, if it's pure climate funding for, let's say, projects, where the numbers are, then it's up to the donors whether it's still acceptable or not. You can't turn uh, um, yeah, a certain animal into another animal uh, unless you do some uh, genetic engineering. But um, yeah, that's the that's the issue. So I think we uh, there's a tendency to that I make projects in the shape of what the donors requesting, and I think that's wrong. We should stick to what it is. And uh, if there's a lack of money for other types of projects, then that needs to follow a different route uh, to market. Hello, uh, it's Peter Anderson from the European Investment Bank. Um, I'm just interested in the panel's thoughts on the need to report on absolute emissions as well as relative emissions since we can have projects um, which from a relative point of view look beneficial, but from an absolute emissions point of view can be quite significant, given that we're, in terms of the Paris Agreement, look, really are considering absolute emissions at the end of the day. Would? Yeah, no, uh, let's say we, we, we do both. Uh, there has always been a discussion and a, a kind of the focus on uh, reductions. But I think we need to come clear that the, the absolute gross emissions or net increase of some projects uh, needs to be reported as well. Uh, that's, that's going to be a fact of life. It, it's it's one key issue, of course. It's the question of baseline, in a way. It's whether you take a baseline with uh, without the project or a, base, a baseline with an alternative of a project, and then to compare. Then you have different type of approach. What what, what we decide is to have at least uh, transparency on that to, to calculate both relative to and and, uh, and and gross emission and. Um, that's, well, that's why harmonization is very key. And it's not only a question of adopting the same factor. Of course, it's very technical. It's very important because then you have a sort of standard. You, but it's also to define the same type of baseline methodology. And, and there is an approach now for at least those three sectors we manage. And uh, yes, there's still discussion, for instance, on, on green uh, uh, on greenfield investment. We, we do not manage to have, a, uh, for now, a, a clear, uh, a similar view on this. So there's still work, as you mentioned, of course, uh, on this. But what we manage is at least for very important type of sector to, uh, to have a, a, a better uh, harmonized approach for both baseline uh, uh, factor, emission factors, perimeters. That's, uh, But good question. But good question. <laughs> good question. Any further questions from the Still audience? Time. All right. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, because there is nobody asking for a question. Maybe it's an opportunity for me. Uh, yeah, I'm Masam Bachoy. I'm uh, um, working for the UNFCCC secretary. So I take this opportunity because there is no question to maybe uh, ask one, one, one question. Um, I understand very much that the focus of the working group 
um, for the time being, for the short to medium, medium term, is uh, evaluation of impact related to mitigation activities, which is, which is great. But I would like just to build on something that was uh, mentioned by Pierre and, and ask him to maybe a little bit further elaborate on, on that aspect. We know that what is the most important thing now on which we are working is the implementation of the Paris Agreement. And when it comes to mitigation, this is about achieving the objective of two degrees Celsius. So this is our main focus. So it means that on top of uh, assessing the impact of project, it may be also useful to assess to what extent the project is contributing or a fund or a flow of finance is contributing to the achievement of the two degrees Celsius goal. Um, I know that at France, there are some work that are done in this area. Maybe Pierre, you can a little bit elaborate on what you are doing and to what extent the scope of the working group could maybe in the medium to longer term be extended to cover this important aspect. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, we are still working on so I hope we manage to have uh, for our new strategy that will be uh, decided early uh, next year uh, something for that uh, something that is additional to what we take as uh, um, uh, as, as a first step mean with the, what, I, what I mentioned the, the objective quantitative objective but also the the obligation to have a measurement, carbon footprint measurement. Uh, it's it's something about how to to uh, have the uh, the right um, the right um, method to discuss with the country or to analyze the contribution or the, the target of the country regarding uh, this is NDC. And the right approach means not only to see the 2025 or 2030 targets that is mentioned by the NDC, but also what is what, what it's behind that and what can be then the curve uh, at the long term curve with the goal of two degrees and the goal of zero emission, the very, very long term. And it means then you have to discuss whether the shoes that have been uh, the, the, taken by the country is the, uh, the the right option regarding both its capacity, the social acceptation, environmental acceptation, but also the, the effect and the flexibility it gives to the future ambition in terms of uh, decreasing the curve. Then you have the, the effect of lock-in. When, when you speak about uh, uh, climate, you always speak at first for uh, about energy, and energy is very long term infrastructure. Then, if you have now the infrastructure, now you have this for 100 years, or maybe not, but a lot of years, then you, you have a lock in effect. You can't, even if you manage to have your eight person target of decreasing or infl inflation, you will not be able to have a better target at the, uh, in the future. So. What can be the alternative? What can be the solution? So we are working on new model of for analyzing the, 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 the contribution of countries. And then the same on our side, new model to, uh, to, uh, we, we, to change the way we decide of our own strategy country by country. And then project by project in order to stimulate the debate. The debate when we speak about climate is usually well we don't know the long-term effects. So we know that in the perimeter, the GSG emission accounting is good, then it's okay. But what is the long-term effect? I don't know, uh, and it could be very key. So to, imp to, to improve that, and maybe at the end, we will have a, we will have a sort of um, a metric that say, uh, we can give a, a sort of a note uh, to that, that's given an, uh, an information of the, the level of contribution of the project to the, 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 new, uh, the new development model of the, of the country, the, 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 the engagement of the country. It's trying to, to have a sort of measurement of the level of contribution uh, with this, this different tool. But it's, it's very, 
we, we you start discussing that it's, it's very difficult in, in a way because oh, you don't have a metric a simple metric but it's I, we think it's very key because then you have something that is the implementation of the Paris Agreement and the end. All right, if there's no further questions, um, maybe I'll just give a very, very short, brief summary of, of, of what I heard and then turn to my, my panelists if they want to ask me any additions. <coughs> what we were trying to do was to highlight the opportunities and challenges and the way forward dealing with the harmonization needed um, among the IFIs and beyond. Um, and what I heard was, uh, this is not new. A lot of work has been done over the late years. If that work is not harmonized necessarily. A lot more progress has been made on measuring than on reporting. Um, scope is inadequate. There's things that still aren't covered and are complex and need to be covered. Um, I heard that investors, the donors, the countries, this will bring hopefully some confidence, some credibility, some better understanding of the impact. Um, I heard that this is part of the solution of unlocking the finance and the flows that are needed and the scaling up that is needed to deliver on the Paris Agreement. I heard that there's an effort here to be part of the push, push the issue, to encourage greater discrimination of, of what, where we're putting our money, where the money is going, what we're trying to get out of it. Push the curve, to think in terms of, of the 2050 goals, the longer term targets, and how this can be a part of that. Um, and questions around do we do more than just a quantitative? Do we try to do the qualitative? Um, that is part of the process, that it's, it helps to create the links that the national governments also need to do in their planning. And perhaps it's part of the building blocks needed for the NDC process. And then finally, I heard that this is complex, but we don't need to make it complicated. We need to keep it simple. Um, we need to understand that not everyone has the same needs, that there's various actors out there, and the actors vary in their ability to implement so those are the points that I noted in terms of summary. Any, any additional thoughts from the panel? All right, well, I would like to thank our, our panel for their time and thank the audience for their interest. And uh, I'd like to close then. Yeah.